Stay tuned. Coming up on this episode is part two of my interview with Chris and Sam Adams, twin brothers and first responders from Colorado Springs, Colorado, talking about their book, Life and Death Matters, Professionalism and Decision-Making for First Responders. But first, let's pay the bills. Today's episode is sponsored by Midwest Fire. For more than 20 years, Midwest Fire has been manufacturing high-quality tankers, tanker pumpers, and fire rescue vehicles in the United States and Canada. Keeping firefighters safe while enhancing their capabilities is what they do best. To learn more, go to MidwestFire.com. Hello and welcome to episode 283 of the Situation Awareness Matters show. I'm your host, Rich Gassaway. The purpose of this program is to help improve situation awareness and high-risk decision-making for individuals and teams who work in high-stress, high-consequence, time-compressed environments with changing conditions. The SA Matters mission is simple. We want to help you see the bad things coming in time to avoid bad outcomes. I'm coming to you today from my office in St. Paul, Minnesota, having just returned from conducting situation awareness for EMS programs for Coastal Bend Regional Advisory Council in Corpus Christi. Today's feature segment is brought to you by Sims You Share. Sims You Share is a simple and affordable way to help you develop and practice situation awareness skills. You can quickly build Sims from your photos to simulate almost any kind of incident, including active threat scenarios. And the new Sims You Share Command Training Center now lets you conduct multi-company drills over the internet, so you can run drills while your companies stay in station. Check them out at simsyoushare.com. All right, let's jump into today's feature segment, part two of my two-part interview with Chris and Sam Adams discussing their book, Life and Death Matters, Professionalism and Decision-Making for First Responders. All right, what I'm going to ask you to do now, which, you know, is (laughs) putting you on the spot uh, because we didn't uh, really uh, set this up in advance, I'm going to ask each of you to pick two powerful lessons from the book. So two from each of you, four four powerful lessons. And hopefully if you do this well, somebody's going to say, wow, there's four lessons and there's 40 more. I got to get that book. You know, holy cow, what a value add just to sit in this podcast and just get those four lessons. So you want to cherry pick the four best or or four in the middle and then say there's even better ones in the book however you want to bait however you want to bait that up um give give us four powerful uh kind of shazam that's good stuff kind of lessons come that come out of the book so i'll start with the first one and it sort of tags on to what i was just talking about with this idea of humility i never really considered the significance of operating with humility and what that does for us as paramedics and first responders. But it's so, it's so important for us to operate with that mindset and that disposition towards the job. And it does a number of things. The, the first thing it does is it puts you in the proper mindset to approach a call, approach a scene so that you're never becoming overly confident about what it is that you're running into, what it is that you're going into. Um, humility forces you it, it's if people have this idea that there's this fight between humility and confidence and there's really not you can be very confident person but operate with humility and a great degree of it but I think that the the big thing that you never want to become is arrogant and prideful as it relates to the first responder because then we begin to miss things we be, begin to become sort of complacent about how it is that we're treating people, how it is that we're moving forward to a scene. And even in the fire world, if you become arrogant and prideful towards a structure fire, you're going to, it could not be 
a very good day. You have to be very humble about how it is you're approaching things. And I think that one of the things that's so, in, that's so awesome about humility is that there's this idea that the ever opposing view of humility in my estimation is complacency. Because what happens is that if you operate with this prideful attitude and that you know all and have seen all and have been exposed to everything, then what happens is you become complacent. And so then you begin to dwindle in your skills, your medical principles and knowledge begin to suffer because you, you no longer feel like that's important for you to maintain those skills, maintain that knowledge. You become complacent. Humility forces you with your concepts of self-reflection to always be continually in this moment of growth and this moment of trying to become better, whether it's at the firehouse, whether it's in the fire station, whether it's on the fire scene, whether it's in the medical world with paramedicine or EMTs. But what humility does is it forces you to reflect upon the things that you might be a little bit deficient in. And so then if you understand that you're deficient in certain things and you operate with humility, then you'll actually do something with the intention of making that deficiency better. And so then what happens is that if you develop a plan and you develop this idea and this approach of becoming better with the intention of addressing that specific thing, then it becomes a strength. And now all of a sudden you're operating at a very high level because you're continually addressing things that you feel are, you're deficient in. And then they're readdressed and readdressed and then you become stronger and stronger and better and better. Something that I talk that, that we say is this idea that I truly believe that humility is the knife's edge. Humility is what brings you to the top of your game. It's what makes you the, the, the premier paramedic, the premier first responder, the premier firefighter. Humility allows you the attitude to approach the pinnacle of your practice, but it's a knife's edge. Because if you, re if you maintain that disposition once you get to be the premier paramedic or first responder and you continually operate with humility, you'll stay there. You'll stay on the top. It'll, it's, your, it's, it's the key to your edge. Humility is the key to your edge. If you ever drop it and you become complacent, even if you've reached that top, then you quickly fall. Because now, now all of a sudden you become arrogant and prideful and then complacent. And it's a rapid fall to the to the bottom and now you have to work diligently to get back to the top and so that's my first little hey, thing. bar set pretty high sam can you top that yeah i know <laughs> um, or did he cherry pick the best one <laughs> i did <laughs> no i don't know no, no i don't think so but that's a personal thing that i really i really have been thinking a lot about this idea of humility yeah and I think it's so important. I think the first thing for me would be the first lesson to take away from the book is, uh, is I, I helped write a chapter in there called There Is No Gray, which I think is a hilarious chapter. And I think that it's, it's not hilarious in the sense that it's funny. It's, it's, it's funny to me because it flies in the face of what we do in EMS. And I think that there's this pervasive idea that there's gray situations that we run into in EMS. And I just don't believe that. And I think that there's gray situations because there's a lack of accountability, a lack of ownership, a lack of preparation, a lack of decision-making capability and a lack of understanding to interpret the information that you're gaining correctly and then filter it and prioritize it and then execute treatment plans. And I think that that's the biggest takeaway from the book for me. Yeah. Number one would be, would be that there, the idea that there is no gray situation that we go on. And let me premise that by saying that we specifically say that that doesn't mean that there's really difficult decisions that you have to make. And there's con there, you can get into confusing situations, but because of those situations we get into, it requires decisive action. And so if you go into those situations predisposed with an idea that this is going to be a gray area, then it causes a lack of decisiveness and it causes patient care to decline. 
Absolutely. And I think that you can be confident in the decisions that you do make. Just, it doesn't matter what it is. If you make a decision and take ownership for that decision that you're making, then it's not really a gray area. You're, you are taking accountability for what's happening. And so I think that that's kind of a cop out for a lot of people to say that. And it, it causes them, it's, it, it's a little bit of a um, so-called security blanket. And I think that it's really good to address that. And I know that I address that with everybody that I, mm-hmm. that I talk to, you know, and just to t- tag team on that, I think that that is one of the biggest contributions. We were speaking earlier about this idea of um, burnout and first responder burnout. I think that that contributes to it because you have these yeah. diametrically opposed ideas, right? On one hand, you have this idea that what you do matters and the decisions that you make really impact people's lives as a first responder. But then on the other hand, you're advocating for this idea that it doesn't really matter and what you do, the decisions are sort of gray and don't have any sort of meaning to them because it's a gray area and it doesn't matter what happens. And I think that when, you, when you're fighting yourself back and forth with that sort of attitude, it creates great consternation in your head and you become confused and you don't understand that there's a purpose behind what it is you should be doing. You should be operating with intention and moving forward with a developed plan to execute and not this concept of grayness so that we don't know what we're doing or it's unknowable. And it's like, if you, if you feel like that's the position you're in, you should be hitting the books. You should be understanding what your leader's intent is. You should be understanding what the medical directors are requiring of you. Understanding what the guidelines are setting forth. There's no guideline that I've ever read that says, oh, well, you know, if it's a gray area, just, you know, do whatever. Good luck. Good luck. That's not how the medical directors, that's not the intention of their protocols. And so operating like that, I think causes great consternation with people and, it confuses them and it's very difficult. Yeah. That's definitely the number one takeaway for me. I think for me, the, this is a tough one because I've got several things in my head, but that I could talk about one more. (laughs) So what I'll do is really tag on the, the end of our book. The third section is this is really um, devoted to teaching others and the principles of, how to develop people, yeah. how to develop people. And I think that one of the greatest things that this book really impacted me was the idea of developing expectations with your precepting student or, or, or um, your new intern to the department or whatever it is as the preceptor. Because I think that when you develop that sort of, level of expectations you one should always have an expectation of yourself going into the internship you should always expect something of yourself you should always have expectations of your student and what it is that you are expecting of them right and you should always always tell your student what it is that they can expect from you and then lastly you have to have to have to give your student an opportunity to tell you what their expectations are. And I know that that seems sort of silly to some people, but it's really important. It's really important to allow the new student, the new paramedic to elaborate on what it is that they're expecting out of the internship. And we all know the big picture. I want to get through paramedic school. I want to pass. I want to right. But students, you'd be, you would be surprised have very specific expectations. For example, I want to work on, I really, really want to come out of here with a very high working knowledge of a mental status exam. How is it that you move forward and methodically assess a mental status? That's my expectation. I want to move out of here with a great confidence that I can address any respiratory with high degree of confidence. That's what's so great about this book is what we do is we take these principles And what they do is they decrease the lag time of working with a preceptor to functioning confidently as an independent paramedic, if that makes sense. 
So there's this lag time between when you, when you finish your internship with your paramedic preceptor, you begin functioning independently. Well, sometimes that before you start really functioning confidently, you, it can be a great deal of time. And so what we've done with this book is try and decrease that lag time so that you can stop your internship or whatever your field instruction and then move forward very confidently. And that's our third section is really devoted to teaching others. And I think that that's important for all people to understand in any discipline, whether it's firefighting, setting expectations is so incredibly important for everybody so that everybody's on the same page there's no hidden agendas there's no unknowns there's no 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 surprises nobody's going to be surprised by anything so that was one of the other things that i took away from this okay yeah the last the last thing that i would say the second thing for me would be there's a section that we talk about decision making and what's kind of interesting is a is what we tried to do was take a bunch of different factors that affect decision making and then articulate it and define it in a way that is meaningful to first responders. And so, you know, like how does you, how do you make decisions? How do you go about making decisions? What factors affect your decision making? And so like knowledge and experience and outside factors, outside influences, Uh, all these different things. And we go through a list of about 14 or 15 and identify what those are and define how those affect you as a first responder in your ability to uh, make decisions and and advocate for your patient appropriately. And I think that that's a really good section and it really builds upon the integrated approach of pre-hospital care and the need for a good decision-making process that you, that each individual must develop. So dude, give us an example of what that looks like. Like with the integrated approach, right? You have your medical knowledge that is one level and then you have your accountability. And I think that the, as a, as a personal character attribute, right? The attributes of an accountability, honesty, and integrity, And so that directly impacts your ability to make a decision. If you know that when you make a decision, it's a personal decision, it's a, it's an immediate reflection on your own personal understanding of the situation, understanding on what's going on. It drives you back to medical knowledge. It drives you back to the the books, drives you back to understanding what it is that you're supposed to be doing. Right? Because why you're going to take accountability and own the decision that's, being made and what's in front of you. It's no longer this abstract gray idea. It's a personal idea. It's a personal decision. And it's a reflection on your own understanding as an individual. And now you're operating like an extreme professional because you've adopted these principles of humility. Now you're at the top. You're identifying what it is that you were deficient in. It's driving you back to the books. Now you're becoming strong in those areas. And so that's an example of why the integrated approach is so extremely important and makes such successful first responders and paramedics and firefighters in any discipline. And I I just want to add really quick too, is that these principles really can be adopted in any discipline. This is not paramedic specific. It's written from our perspective as paramedics, but we're also first responders and firefighters and so it's we've had so many people come to us and talk about this how how it impacted them and how they enjoyed the book so much that are not paramedics all right i'm going to ask you guys uh one last question then i'm going to summarize based on some notes that i've made here um make the strong connection between the concepts of your book and situational awareness, although you've made some discussion of it so far, I want, I want to remove any potential um, vagueness that somebody might have in their mind about, well, why did you have these guys on as a guest? What's the yeah. situational awareness connection to this message? So here's your chance to take that swing. Well, I, I think that it is – it's really easy to make that connection. So what happens is that you become 
whatever discipline you're in, whether it's firefighting, paramedics, banking, accounting, whatever it is, you become methodical in the way that you approach problems and you are interpreting information the same way and you're filtering that information and then you are consistently and reliably categorizing what you're looking at and then you're able to execute a plan for whatever problems in front of you. So why that affects directly situational awareness is that it increases your bandwidth. So when you're stepping off the engine or you're stepping out of the truck, you're no longer concerned necessarily about the specific task in front of you and how you lay out your nozzle. How do you deploy your hose line? How do you deploy your ladder? How am I going to start an IV? Now your bandwidth is, is because you've, already addressed how that's going to happen. So now your bandwidth is able to see, recognize, Hey, uh, I've already laid the hose line out, but you know what? There's smoke coming out of the gable end over there that I don't know if anybody sees because you've taken the time to be methodical about how you lay up your hose line. So you're not concerned as much about that anymore. Now you're concerned about sizing up your building and see where the smoke's coming from, or you're not concerned about how to set up an IV because you know how you're going to do it. You know when you're going to do it. You know when you're going to do a 12 lead. You know what types of patients you need a 12 lead on. Now you're able to extend your bandwidth and realize that actually I'm in a really bad situation here and there's a gun behind the back door where we don't have a real good egress out of this center hallway and this is kind of a volatile uh, situation that we're in and your situational awareness improves drastically when you have a methodical approach and an integrated approach to how you address problem solving and how you address how you are going to make decisions within that problem solving, whether it's firefighting, paramedicine, it doesn't really matter because now you just are able to um, take in more information and you're able to see things that normally people wouldn't see, but you can't do that unless you conscientiously develop the skill set of, an integrated approach, a methodical approach, a decision-making approach. How do you, how do you size up a building? How do you read smoke? How do you throw your ladders? How do you deploy your hose line? How do you set up your IV? How do you set up a tube for innovation? How are you going to RSI somebody? When do you, when are you going to RSI somebody? And when you do that methodically, it drastically improves your situational, your situational awareness. And then you become much more capable of putting yourself in good situations and uh, setting yourself up for success. And yeah, and I, that is great. I completely agree just to tag on too. I think that there's a few other things too. One, when you, when we talk about all of these things as developing people, we are talking about how important it is to develop our teams. And so when you develop your team, now you've got four people with you that are extremely successful and extremely capable. And now their bandwidth is increased. And so now you've got more people on a scene that are more aware about what's going on because they're able to filter more information because they, because for, for example, you've set the expectations with them. They know what to expect from you. And so now when they start to see you deviate from something, then they can address it and say, Hey, are you aware of this over here? Did you hear this? And that's very specific awareness of maybe a specific patient presentation, but those things are important on a scene. And I think that when you start to deviate from your methodical approach, it can, it can alert your teammates of something that you might not have been aware of if you've taken the time to develop them as a team and develop them as a member of the patient care. I think also one of the great things about situational awareness and the methodical approach is that when you become methodical about how you um, approach scenes and approach patients and you do, and you inter- implement that, implement that re- approach consistently, then what happens is you slowly over time begin to create a degree of reliability. Now your methodical approach is very reliable. And so then when there's small things that aren't making sense, you'll be able to pick out the little thing in the room that, would have never stood out to you before because now you're more aware about what's going on. You're more aware about the scene because you know what to expect. Um, And so when you become really extremely reliable, it allows you to be more aware about what is going on around you. 
And so I think that's a, one, it's important to, to do that because, you know, for me, for me personally, I work on an engine company that covers a really super busy interstate and it allows me to not really be so focused on necessarily what is going on with the patient. And I'm able to recognize, Hey, this is a bad situation. There's snow on the road or there's rain or there's cars whizzing by us. We need to get off the interstate and go down um, and, and conduct patient care elsewhere, or we need to block off an extra lane. And it increases your bandwidth because you're not so concerned. You're like, you're methodical in the way that you're approaching patient care. So you're able to, do assessments extremely quickly and recognize life threats really quickly because you're methodical in the way you do it. You implement that consistently. It becomes reliable and then it becomes reproducible. And then you're able to just execute a treatment plan really quickly. And so, and then because of that, uh, you're now much more aware of your surroundings and you're able to address things that normally you wouldn't be able to. And sometimes that can take a long time. I mean, it can take some experience to be able to, to be able to do that, but it's important to address those things early on in someone's career and reinforce the importance of those instead of just your ability to identify a left bundle branch block because it's just going to be safer and for everybody, your whole team, it's going to be much better off. Good. Good stuff. Uh, you guys got a website? We do. It's www.field-medics.com. Okay. And if somebody wanted to buy the book, where would they go? So you can go to our website, which has a direct link to Amazon. It's on Amazon. That's where you can buy it. Um, it's a, it's available in paperback and also ebook through the Kindle app. So you can, whichever option you choose, um, that's where to go. Okay. And uh, is there anything that you guys wanted to talk about that uh, we haven't talked about because I didn't ask the right question? I don't think so. I know we had a good, I I think it was a good conversation. Oh, it was really good. Yeah. Really good. I, I took two pages of notes. <laughs> and uh, those I hope were, that's a good thing. Yeah. yeah <laughs> I, I, if somebody ever saw me, I was, I was looking like I was heads down. It's because I got all these, these index cards that I'm filling up with with notes that I end up then making the show notes for the, uh, for the show. And then I put little, little timers on so that I can uh, uh, take snippets and put that in, in like little commercials for the, uh, for the episode as well. So I got a lot of stuff here. This is, this is good content. And I think I have to agree that I don't know of any book out there that has taken the approach that you have taken to share that what you have shared in the way that you have shared it. So I would put this in the category of you've made a unique and special contribution um, to the first responder world and perhaps beyond, as you said, it has a broader application. I have written uh, <laughs> about seven books and three additional that were co-authored. So I know the labor of love and the time and the rewrites and the <clears throat> just never seems to be just exactly the way you want to say yeah. it and, and nope. uh, the challenges of two authors <clears throat> figuring out and agreeing on the way things should be said. And uh, so I want to say thank you for making that contribution uh, to the first responder world. I'm going to encourage the, uh, the listeners and the viewers to swing over to the website of uh, field-medics.com or to Amazon directly. Uh, and get the Life and Death Matters Professionalism and Decision Making for the First Responder. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Sam, for joining me today. Well, thank you for having us. Um, we're also, you can also find us on Instagram and Facebook. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Say that too. Oh, that's, yeah. You can find us on Instagram and Facebook at Field Medics. Um, but I also want to, and the best way to get in touch with us is probably through Either you can email us at info at field-medics.com is our email. You can also DM us on Instagram, which is a great way to get in touch with us as well. Um, but I also wanted to thank you for all the things that you've done and the contributions to situational awareness. I think about it 
very specific call that I had that had a very, very big impact on my life and my identifying how incredibly important it is for us as first responders to be aware of what it is that we're doing and being always ever vigilant, looking out for our teammates, looking out for ourselves, looking out for the patient. So thank you as well for everything that you put out and do for us as first responders. Is, is that a call you, that, that you shared earlier or is this a different call? Uh, it's a different call. It's a different call. Okay, I'll extend the podcast for five minutes. <laughs> <You don't. laughs> I well, want to hear this. I was a, um, I had been working in a 911 system as a medic for maybe tens of hours, so a couple of weeks, and I hadn't had my first traumatic arrest yet. And I guess I'll preface that by saying we as first responders are not excited or we don't take joy or pleasure in the tragedy of others but i think we understand that these sorts of events happen and we want to be a part of trying to solve the problem so anyhow i'll preface that with saying that we were on a minor very minor traffic accident in the middle of the road yeah and i was standing at the at the patient's door doing a very very minimal patient refusal, didn't want to go to the hospital. No, no injuries, just a real quick, you know, if anything's changing, call us back, call 911, go down to the hospital, get checked out type of deal. So we clear the scene and get back in the ambulance and we're driving away. And all I hear on the radio is bring the ambulance back code three for an auto pad. And I'm like, we weren't gone from the scene for a minute. And we flip around and I'm like, what happened? We were just there. I don't understand what is taking place here. And we showed up on scene and this individual had been hit by a drunk driver that split a tow truck and a fire engine and cones that were placed out and police. And I don't know how he went through and he hit this person and it was my first traumatic cardiac arrest. And the thing that really stuck in my head was one minute before, one minute, I was standing in the same place that person got hit. Yeah. And I've never forgotten that. And it has made me so, it's really impacted my willingness to be very much aware of what the surroundings are, what's going on. So... Let me ask you a, a follow-up to that. Yeah. As you went back and you saw the accident and you thought you said to yourself, I was just standing there just a few minutes ago. Mm -hmm. Did you make any kind of after the fact reflection about this? Did I realize when I was standing here that this could have happened while I was standing here? In other words, was that on your mind? that this could happen, but you yeah. thought, well, no, low probability, or was it just like not even anywhere on the radar that this could happen? It, that's, that's why I think it impacted me so much because it wasn't on my radar in any way. I, I, was, I, I was very comforted by the scene presence of the police, the fire the apparatus, the ambulance, the um, tow, truck. tow trucks. And so I was very comfortable and, what I became was complacent. And, 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 and there I was, that, good. Oh, I was just going to say, I think that that is why it impacted me so much because afterwards I realized how <clears throat> unaware I was and how I was just not taking into consideration what was going on around me and the danger that we see and how important it is that you're just on your toes and that's why you got to have an approach. You got to be methodical about how you do things and what you're looking for specifically so that you can be aware of that stuff. And so it impacted me. I was not aware, didn't even think twice about it. And then after obviously running the call, I was very much aware. It, so, there, there was, there was, while you were standing there, whether you realized it or not, there was a clear pathway for a civilian vehicle to get direct contact with you 
while you were standing there, but you didn't see that clear pathway at that moment. Right. Isn't that, right. Oh, that's, 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 that's very sobering to see that tragic aftermath and realize that just a few minutes earlier, you were in the same spot without the awareness of how vulnerable you were in that moment at that spot. I can only imagine how that impacted you. Yes, it was sobering is a great word for it. And so I really appreciate what you've done and you're bringing it to bringing situational awareness to our awareness. Yeah. Yeah, so it, Thank you. it's uh, like you, it's been kind of like a, you know, a labor of love that you just move, you, you, you move the topic along, you try to make your contributions and mm-hmm. you hope it makes a difference. Just like you guys, you write the book, you hope somebody reads it, you hope it helps them. Right. And that's right. the, it, what else could drive us, but the hope that, that what we have to share could actually help someone be a better decision maker, to be more committed to their job, to be more personally invested and, and responsible, self-responsible for what they do. And, and I, I know that's your, that's your passion. And I, and I, we just never really, we never really know till we put ourselves out there. And right. I'm sure, you know, yeah. I didn't, I guess got to ask you one other thing here. Cause I didn't, ask you, and I, I might even edit this out at the end. I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, you guys got any critics? Um, well, we've gotten, as far as reviews go, we've gotten really good yeah. reviews on Amazon. Um, we've got quite a few really good five-star reviews on Amazon. Um, I think that the biggest critics that we have that don't, the biggest section that people have an issue with is probably that there is no gray section. And I've had some pushback on that a little bit, but for the most part, people really enjoy what it is that we're, that we're saying. I think that's what's nice about the book is that we're not really saying anything groundbreaking that people don't already know, right. but we've articulated and organized it in a fashion that can really impact people and help them in their own practices as a medic or a firefighter. But if there was one section, I think that that would be that. And I think people really like to hold on to those gray areas. It's, it's interesting, interesting that you would say that, Sam, because as you said, the, the, the area you want to talk about, there is no gray. I, I was hearing what you were saying, and I thought to myself, I got to believe there are people out there in the world who are just not going to buy that. Yeah, that's, that's <laughs> definitely it. But you know, the interesting thing, <clears throat> excuse me, is that once they read it and then we explain things to people, they go – well, actually, that's a pretty good way. You know, I was having a conversation with a guy the other day. He called me up and said, hey, we had this call. And everybody thought it was great. And I don't understand how this isn't gray. And so I said, well, come on, let's have a chat. And I sat him down and we had this conversation. And he came away from it and going, yeah, that's, that's not very gray. That's pretty clear what yeah. you should be doing. And well, so that's, that's probably the biggest Opponent. Yeah, gray areas are not about decision making; it's about accountability. Right. Yeah. yeah. You know, all you can hope is that people would give you the gift of an open mind. Exactly. To to t- to accept perhaps a different way of looking at things that they have become so accustomed to and habitual to, and to step out of that very comfortable place of I know how things are yeah. and supposed to be, and and have somebody's new ideas come in and and, and to to keep your mind um, open enough to accept a different way of looking at things. And that's what we could hope of anybody right. that we're trying to help yeah. and make a difference for. Right. Yeah. All right. Thanks, fellas. I, I, I just had to throw that one other thing in there. And yeah. uh, we're going to go ahead and say our goodbyes. So thanks, thanks for again for, uh, for uh, sitting in on the show. Thank you for the, uh, the compliment about my work. I appreciate that as well. And uh, – uh, gee, we've been at this uh, over an hour, so I appreciate the, the gift of your time, too. Thank we you. Appreciate it. Thank you very much, sir. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you to Chris and Sam Adams for sharing your passion with my listeners and viewers. The Situational Awareness Matters show launched in 2014 with a purpose, to give a platform to those who've had near-miss events to share their stories. 
When I'm on the road delivering classes on situational awareness, I often ask attendees about their near-miss events that they've had, and they have shared some amazing stories. Those stories motivated me to launch this podcast, so those lessons could be shared with a bigger audience, you. The Situational Awareness Matters show, podcast that is SA Matters Radio, and our companion video program, SA Matters TV channel on YouTube, along with other videos that we've posted there, have enjoyed more than 800,000 downloads. I'm so thankful for your support, and I feel so honored to be able to provide a platform for these amazing lessons to be shared. If you like the show, please consider doing me a solid favor. Please subscribe. For the video, for the audio version of the show, search for SA Matters Radio on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher Radio, or iHeartRadio. For the video version, subscribe to SA Matters TV on YouTube. If you find any value in the show, I'd really appreciate it if you would give the show a rating and write a review. Your ratings and reviews help others to find the show, but more importantly, Your feedback inspires me to want to work even harder for you. I think Rich's Rich's ability to to, to connect with any crowd, that's a a gift that he has, and and it's easily transferable. This is the second or third time that I've heard him speak. There's some teeth uh, to the information that that he brings. It's been really good. Good mixes. He knows when to throw in a joke here and there to get you back involved. Some tools. Um, I'm a new lieutenant, so very, very interesting. And some of these things I can take back to the station and use with some of the new firefighters I have my, on my crew. Something to get you thinking about your job more, big picture type stuff. I've seen him before. A good review for sure. I have heard him before, yes. After he speaks, there's usually an enlightenment because now they're more aware of what's going on around them and what they're experiencing as they're responding to calls. He's, he's very, very knowledgeable. I'm enjoying it so far. And that intuition, that's a big one. Um, the video that he just showed up here, we're getting a lot of out of this. this. I think this is a really good seminar, especially for new people and old. But I think it's, it's very informative. This talk gives us more ammunition to, to do all three. They're relatable to what we have experienced or very well could experience, so it makes it easy to let the knowledge sink in. I mean, it's awesome. A lot of stories you can usually relate to yourself and, and calls you have been on, you know, aha moment. Like, he just helps you focus on picking out the right things. It's, it's awesome. It's a refresher and keeps my eyes open. It's good stuff. If people listen to the message that he has, it's an incredible message delivered by a very compassionate person strategy and tactics are going to always change situation awareness is it doesn't change you're all it's always there he's got some good stories to tell and he's very thorough with his stories and it's uh interesting listening to him very clear speaker and he he talks um, on our level because he's been there he's been in the trenches i think he's doing well and i'm looking forward to the second half Since 2007, Situation Awareness Matters instructors have helped more than 1,300 organizations and have trained more than 80,000 individuals to improve high-risk decision-making, including first responders, industrial workers, military personnel, business leaders, medical professionals, utility workers, highway workers, public transportation operators, aviation workers, oil refinery process operators, and more. If you or someone you know works in a high-risk, high-consequence, decision-making environment, then we're here to help to improve your safety and your survival, and to help you accomplish the most important mission of all, and that is to go home to the ones who love you. I'd like to take a moment to honor and thank the companies, organizations, agencies, and departments that have hosted recent situational awareness training for their team members. The Lansing Fire Department in Lansing, Michigan. The Ingham County Fire Chiefs Association, also in Michigan. The Coastal Bend Regional Advisory Council in Corpus Christi, Texas. If you're interested in where we're gonna be upcoming next, here's the schedule. On August 27 through 29, we'll be at the Safety Plus Conference in New Orleans, Louisiana. On completion of the program in New Orleans, the Situational Awareness Matters Tour is taking a six-week sabbatical 
from all presentations to, as Dr. Stephen Covey would say in his book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, we're going to sharpen the saw. And I'm going to focus on my personal development. And while off the road, the podcast will continue to be released weekly, just as scheduled. And if you want to join us upcoming after the sabbatical on October 15th, we'll be at the Illinois Fire Chiefs Association Conference in Peoria. On October 20 and I'm sorry, October 19 and 20 at the Clearwater Regional Fire Service in Rocky Mountain House, Alberta. If you want to see the locations of all the upcoming Situation Awareness Matters tour stop events, just head over to the samatters.com website and click on the red tab labeled Upcoming Events Schedule. If you're interested in hosting a program, just click on the Contact Us tab on the top of the samatters.com page, and I'll give you a call. If you want to become part of the SA Matters community of learners, there are several ways you can do that. Check the show notes for how to get connected with us by signing up for our monthly newsletter, which is free, subscribing to the SA Matters radio podcast, which is free, subscribing to the SA Matters TV YouTube channel, which is free, and how to follow us on the social media channels of Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and Instagram. There we're sharing ideas about how to improve situation awareness, how to make better decisions under stress, and how to improve the skills of critical thinking and resilient problem solving. Well, that's it. Episode 283 of the Situation Awareness Matters show is complete. Thank you again to my guests, Fire Medics Chris and Sam Adams. Thank you to our platinum sponsor, Midwest Fire. Thank you to our feature segment sponsor, Sims You Share. Thank you to our associate sponsor, Chief Miller. Thank you to all the companies, agencies, and organizations that have hosted Situation Awareness Matters training programs. Thank you to all the organizations that have hosted our live stream training program, where I come to your organization live via the internet to train your members. Thank you to the more than 3,000 students and graduates of the highly acclaimed Situation Awareness Matters Online Academy. The feedback I receive from the Online Academy graduates is just amazing and very humbling, and I thank you for that. Most importantly, thank you the listeners and viewers of this show, for sharing some of your valuable time with me today. I really appreciate your support of the SA Matters mission. Be safe out there, and may the peace of the Lord and strong situational awareness be with you always. You've been listening to the Situational Awareness Matters radio show with Dr. Richard B. Gassaway. If you are interested in learning more about situational awareness, human factors, and decision-making under stress, visit samatters.com. If you are interested in booking Dr. Gassaway for an upcoming event, visit his personal website at richgassaway.com.